Hello, I'm Darren Grimes, Digital Manager at the IEA, and in this week's podcast, I'm talking to Dr. Christian Nemitz, Head of Political Economy here at the Institute. And we're discussing two new books that the in which the authors lay out a socialist alternative. The first is Fully Automated Luxury Communism by Aaron Bastani, which explores everything from the route to communism through socialism to universal basic services. But does the book explain why socialism has already been tried more than two dozen times and failed every time without exception? We'll discuss. The second is called The Socialist Manifesto by Baska Sankara. Now, Christian, having read both, I wonder if you can start by explaining what, in your opinion, fully automated luxury communism is. What makes it different from, say, Mao's China or the Soviet Union? He pins, uh, Bastani pins his hope on technology. He says next time will be different because of technological advances. Qu- quite why that should be the case, I still haven't fully that uh, I still haven't fully understood. Uh, you could, of course, imagine a version of the Soviet Union or of Maoist China where they have iPhones and laptops. Uh, I don't see how that would improve the, those societies very much. But yeah, of course, you could make the case, uh, and I think that's sort of what he does, that that Marx originally said that the socialist revolution has to happen first in the places that are where capitalism is at its most advanced. Mm -hmm. Uh, He didn't say when exactly that would be, but you can tell that he was talking about the near future from his perspective, and uh, he was expecting it to happen in somewhere in Western Europe. Okay, so if, let's say, that had happened in Western Europe in 1900, that would still be, by today's standards, a fairly low level of technological development. So it's not clear why um, why Eastern Europe in the 1950s or 60s would, would have been not advanced enough for socialism. It is true that the Russian Revolution and the Chinese Revolution occurred in places where uh, capitalism had barely started. Those were mostly agrarian societies, underdeveloped economies. That was true in the beginning. However, in t- at least in its final decades, the, the Soviet Union was technologically fairly advanced. Mm-hmm. It was that they were always rubbish at making consumer goods and services. That's always been the issue with socialist economies. But um, in terms of, of uh, engineering, science, they were fairly advanced. They were, they were not uh, a third world country in that sense. So it's not clear that it is the level of technological development that stopped them. They did, after all, uh, put the first satellite into orbit. It isn't that. And that that's just the Soviet Union. Uh, elsewhere in Eastern Europe, uh, socialism started in some, some of the most advanced economies in the world, actually Czechoslovakia um, and uh, to a lesser extent Poland and, and, and also Hungary. Those were very developed, very rich places, East Germany even more so. So there we're getting much closer actually to the kinds of uh, conditions that Marx was uh, would would have expected the socialist revolution to but occur. But you see even in East and West Germany, don't you, the, the difference between, because in a planned economy, you can't, you, well, you just don't know what consumer demand is going to be. You can't let the market decide and therefore you've got people in East Germany trying to buy televisions in a different colour in West Germany that are also being produced by East Germany. You know, it's I, I, how do you think he wants to get around those... I guess falls in in a planned economy of a planned economy. Does he explain this? No, no, no. Okay. There's, there's there's not a lot on uh, the the old um, socialist calculation problems, the kind of problems that socialist societies had in coordinating the economy without market prices. How you would go about that? How the planners would acquire sufficient knowledge? Uh, that's all. There's not much on that in the book. It really is just the idea, next time will be different because now we've got the technology. And you argue um, or make clear that you have a hunch that Bastani would probably, I think grudgingly, concede that all of the technological wonders that he describes in the book um, is to a large extent a product of capitalism. But then he goes on 
to argue that we need to drop all of that and embrace communism. Isn't acknowledging capitalism's achievements and advocating its replacement contradictory? Not necessarily if you approach this from a classic Marxist angle. Marx was also impressed by the technological progress that he witnessed, uh, understandably, uh, when when Marx w was born, when Marx w was uh, during Marx's childhood, the, the region in which he grew up was still largely agrarian, fairly backwards, and then by the time he wrote the Communist Manifesto, um, the world had changed beyond recognition, or at least a part of the world where he lived. He saw the first railroads appearing. He saw the first. He saw um, steam engine powered factories springing up all over the place. So by the time he wrote the, the Communist Manifesto, there had been huge technological uh, and economic progress, mm -hmm. and he was impressed by that. He acknowledged all that. The way he reconciled uh, his disgust for capitalism with uh, the admiration that he also had for capitalism was that he said, well, yeah, capitalism is a necessary stage of development. There is um, for societies that are in the early stages of industrialization, there capitalism is the appropriate system. All societies have to go through capitalism. You can't skip that, or maybe under later on he alluded to that maybe that might be possible to, to skip a step. But broadly, he was saying societies have to go through capitalism for a while capitalism is the optimal system. It's just that at some point, it becomes a hindrance. At some point, uh, capitalism reaches its senate, and then from then on, it's downhill. It then produces economic crises. It then leads to the immiseration of workers. And there comes a point when, when where capitalism is just no longer viable. You have to overthrow it and start from scratch. Which Marx completely. thought would happen long before now, which Bastani yes. says happened in 2008. He said that's when the entire system, you know, everyone lost trust in, in the system altogether. And I, I guess to a certain extent, I mean, there clearly is public opinion to support that, isn't there? Because, I mean, four in ten Americans now believe that socialism would be good for the United States, while a 2016 YouGov poll found that the British people were more likely to view socialism favourably than capitalism. You know, maybe both of these books have something to say because social democracy's achievements have always been eventually swept away by capitalist structural power and it's time to try something new. There's clearly public demand there, isn't there? There is public demand, yeah, no, no doubt about that. And they, they, they are tapping into, both of these books uh, are tapping into a popular sentiment that is around at the time. That is the zeitgeist now. It, it is so, Socialism has definitely witnessed a massive resurgence in popularity. So there's, there's no doubt that they are much closer to public opinion, mainstream opinion than we are, unfortunately. Is he right then that under capitalism, automation will lead to widespread technological unemployment, which I think is how he puts it? Yes, he says that. Uh, the trouble with that is we have already seen massive technological progress and productivity improvements since the beginning of industrialization and so far it absolutely has not had that effect you would expect to see at least the beginnings of that already and we absolutely don't at least in britain the employment rate is the highest it's ever been or at least the highest since records began comparable records began uh, what happens with automation is simply that automation in particular sectors destroy jobs in those sectors but you also make us richer that's the whole point because we have competition in product markets so therefore those productivity gains get passed on to consumers and that means the consumer has effectively more money in their pockets or not nominally but every pound that they have in their pocket uh, stretches further and that means they can afford things that they would previously have thought of as luxuries and, and that's how new industries emerge and uh, new jobs are being created. Tourism would be a good example. Um, if you look at the first consumer expenditure surveys, the British ones from, from the 50s, they don't even include tourism or dining out as categories in their own right because that was something very exotic. It existed, of course, but uh, it's something that you would just uh, subsume under other or some generic category it's it was something that was very much reserved for special occasions most families would never go on holiday uh, dining out would be something that you might do maybe for christmas once once a year and uh, nowadays this is something completely commonplace and in that way 
um, loads of new jobs have been created. And this is something that he gets a bit wrong. He says, well, uh, no, more, more than a bit wrong. Uh, he says that most of the the jobs um, that people work in today are not particularly new. So it's not true that new jobs are uh, replacing the old ones. But that's a misrepresentation. The argument was never that we would all become web designers, that we would all work in uh, industries that literally did not exist 30 years ago, that couldn't have been imagined even. It's more that something like tourism, that's a sector which has already existed in Victorian times. So therefore, all the jobs that are in the tourism industry are not new in that, in that sense that a time traveler from 100 years ago would not at all understand what they are. Mm -hmm. It's more that back then, this would have been some, some very exotic fringe phenomenon. Now you've got entire regions that thrive on little else but tourism. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Bastani references the Preston model. He said that this is, this is proof that um, his his model to of socialism for now, I think, is basically what he's arguing for, um, is achievable. I mean, what what is that, and and why do you think he's wrong? Right. Well, he starts to sketch out a, a roadmap from where we are now to well, not quite all the way to the final utopia, but towards a, a heavily state-dominated economy that. I would call socialism, he would probably avoid that term, but it doesn't really matter. One uh, of those uh, steps is the Preston model, which is a model of, of local protectionism. Um, what happened in, in Preston was that uh, the local council said that they and uh, various other public sector organizations should try to spend all of their budgets locally so that the money doesn't leak out. Now, that, that's, uh, of course, a bit absurd. Uh, that, that sounds like trying like the, the economy of North Korea, just at a local level. Uh, and and it, it has to fail for, for the same reason that protectionism just fails in all shapes and guises. That's not even a free market point. That's something yeah. that pretty much all the uh, economists uh, agree on, including left-wing economists like Paul Krugman and Joseph Stieglitz. That's uh, just an absolute that's shared across the board. Um, if that's true for protectionism between nation states, then that must be even more true for protectionism at the local level. Now, it, it is true that on some metrics, um, there, there is this, I think, a McKinsey report which said that Preston has been improving, but they don't mention the so-called Preston model at all. It's just that Preston started from a low base. They had nowhere else to go. Things could only get better, and they did get better, but I'm absolutely certain in a couple of years time somebody will do a proper empirical study of uh, the performance of Preston uh, where they compare Preston to a couple of other places that are otherwise similar and I'm already certain they will conclude it had nothing to do with the so-called Preston model. Mm. And you, um, Bast and well, Bastani briefly toys with the idea of universal basic income but he doesn't like this does he? No. So he quickly dismisses it in favour of a the uh, universal basic services. I wonder if you can explain, Christine, what they are and, and why you're opposed to them. And just, didn't Mil Milton Friedman and Friedrich Hayek both back UBI? And is it something that you think free marketeers should be supporting? What, what, I mean, where is, where is he going with this? Why has he jumped to UBS? Yeah, it's partly for, for that reason that um, some people that he doesn't like, Milton Friedman and Friedrich Hayek, were in favor of a version of a, a basic income, I don't know if universal, but um, yeah, some, some version of, of income support. And uh, therefore he quickly ditches that and says, no, this would just fuel capitalism because on the universal basic income, it's still up to you what you want to spend that money on. You get a lump sum payment from the state on, with without conditions, without strings attached, but it's still up to you what you want to spend it on. You spend it on the market. You still have uh, consumer choice. With universal basic services, that is no longer the case. There, things are allocated to you. The state provides things free at a point of use, and you have to take what you are given. The state would, under this model, uh, provide everything that you that you need, all the basics. You would, in the same way that we now have a national health service, we would then also have a national housing service, um, 
presumably a national transport service, maybe even a national food service. He doesn't ex exactly spell out what, what, what exactly would be included in this. But the basics or the, the, the minimum uh, requirements, that's something that you can define very generously. If you look at the, the Joseph Rountree Foundation's minimum income standard, which is well, not really minimum at all, but a fairly comfortable living standard, if you wanted to have all of that, all of the items that are in that basket, if you wanted all of that to be provided by the state, you would have to nationalize about half of the economy. And that, to me, once again, sounds very much like conventional socialism. So for all the talk about how this will be incomparably different from anything that's gone under the name of socialism or communism before, no, actually, this sounds just like uh, old-fashioned run-of-the-mill socialism again to me. Um, turning to the Socialist Manifesto now, what actually is the manifesto? There's not much of a manifesto. The title is a misnomer. It's mostly a history of socialist movements around the world starting in the mid-19th century. There is a manifesto of sorts in the beginning, the very early stages of the book, where he talks about... Um, where he describes a day in the life of, a, of a, a fictitious person living in in modern day America, as it actually is. Then he moves on to a semi-fictionalized Sweden. That's his way of describing social democracy. And the message here is that this is a lot better, yeah. but it's not there yet. Social democracy is not what he wants, and he makes that quite clear. There is uh, some sometimes those those terms social democracy, democratic socialism get mixed up. Not for him. So he's very clear when he talks about socialism. That is not Sweden. It's not Denmark. It is a properly collectivized economy, and um, that is the part where you could call it. There's, there's a bit of a manifesto there. He then describes a fictitious socialist revolution in a near future America. Uh, all highly idealized. You get the fictitious capitalists uh, just accepts his lot that he gets expropriated or he gets a bit of a compensation and then just chooses to retire. And there are still capitalists around, but they mostly just give up. They realize, ah, oh, there's no point. Uh, the public loves socialism. Uh, nobody is going to like us and they just retire as well. So therefore you don't need uh, gulags. You don't need re-education camps. Everybody just accepts. Okay, we live under socialism now. Fair enough. We resign ourselves to that. Uh, the capitalists accept that they will no longer be capitalists under that system. And therefore, everything is nice and rosy. You, you have uh, a socialist transformation without bloodshed. And then he describes how, in, the, in this fictionalized format, a bit of how um, that will work. So it doesn't go into a lot of detail because the format doesn't, doesn't allow it. it is, it's, it's just an anecdote about a couple of fictitious people. But essentially, he toys with the old idea of, uh, of market socialism. Market socialism is a system in which the state owns the means of production, uh, but the state doesn't run companies. So you don't have a five-year plan. Instead, the workforce of each company rents those productive assets from the state and they run those companies on a democratic basis. So it is as if you had loads of worker cooperatives, but still interacting in a market of sorts. So there would be market prices for goods and services. There would be consumer choice. Companies could go bankrupt. Therefore, you wouldn't need a five-year plan because you would just try to launch a product, hoping that this is what consumers want. If consumers do want it, you sell more of it. If they don't want it, you try something else. But you would still have a market in in that category. Uh, you still have a product market. That's quite clever because that avoids a lot of problems for him. Otherwise, he would have to go into, right, how is your planned economy going to be different? Uh, he's, he would then say, no, I don't want a planned economy. I, I want, well, he doesn't use the term market socialism, but that's essentially what, what he is flirting with here. But there's a couple of problems with that. Um, the way I understood it, the, the conventional idea was that under, under market socialism, you would still have a capital market. You would still have banks, uh, lenders who would, uh, there would be competition in the allocation of capital. He says he doesn't want that. He doesn't want privately owned banks. He wants state banks. They would be, the, they would allocate capital. 
Now, okay, you might have some companies that just don't need to borrow anything because they're well capitalized already, but everyone else who depends on, on borrowing money would then depend on the state. You would have to con try to convince the state-owned bank, um, even if this is, uh, even if it's broken up, you would still have local monopolies. You would have to convince your local state-owned bank that your business plan is better than some alternative that they could also give the money to. There will still be scarcity, of course. They will have to make decisions. They will have to to. Uh, find some way of saying, right, um, because of X, Y, and Z, we're giving this loan to the the Grimes Cooperative and not to the Nemitz Cooperative. Mm -hmm. They would, on, on some basis, they would have to make decisions of that kind. But that to me sounds a lot like central planning again. Yes. If the state is the only uh, uh, organization, the only institution that can allocate credit, allocate capital, if you monopolize the capital market, then that is a form of central planning again. And less than a decade ago, socialists were enthusiastically, in, in a similar sort of utopian way, citing socialism in Venezuela as evidence that another world is possible. Yes. Very, very prominent socialists. Um, is this, do you think, just more of the same? Very much. They avoid talking about Venezuela. In, in uh, Sankara's book, I think it's, it doesn't appear once. But Sankara is uh, the editor and founder of Jacobin magazine. And I know that some of his authors, I don't know if he himself, but certainly some of the people writing for him have been very enthusiastic about Venezuela. And uh, I'm not talking about the early stages when there was a lot of romanticism about it, but there's one guy who still writes about it. Um, I can't remember his name. I'm quoting him in, in, in my own book, definitely, who even when the clampdowns on the opposition had already begun and uh, were well underway, when the when Venezuela had already become an authoritarian police state, as it is now, uh, this author was still defending it and, and saying, yeah, well, this is necessary. What, what do you do? The, there's, there's all these capitalists undermining socialist progress. You have to get rid of them somehow. So basically, the Ken Livingstone argument, Ken Livingstone uh, two years ago said in a, in a radio interview, Venezuela is in trouble because Chavez didn't kill all the oligarchs. Um, that's not quite uh, the way that, that uh, Jacobin magazine puts it, that they wouldn't go quite that far. But yeah, there is this idea that it's all because of capitalists boycotting and sabotaging the economy. That's a mindset that just lends itself to totalitarianism. Once you see the world in that way, that you think everything that's wrong with the economy must be because of some capitalist saboteur trying to undermine your economy, then it's only a small step to, um, to rooting out those um, alleged capitalists and rounding them up. Yeah, I mean, why do you think there's a demand for books like this? And clearly there is, because they wouldn't be, publishers wouldn't be publishing them, right? I, I mean, is it just a millennial phase or is it something, you've wrote in the past that you're not entirely optimistic about uh, some wholesale rejection of socialism coming anytime soon. You actually think that because of uh, markets like the housing market, for example, which has been stifled because of a lack of planning reform, is actually forcing people almost into the arms of socialist ideas that have been tried at what dozens of times before and failed, comprehensively failed, leading to destruction of of lives uh, and and totally completely failing economies. Why do you think this is? And are you actually concerned that, you know, these sorts of voices, these sorts of books will be held up as, you know, this this is the socialist model that will work? This yeah, time. I mean, this this uh, type of socialism, millennial socialism or whatever you want to call it, is the mainstream view now. They they are now the mainstream. They, they, are, they have won the battle of ideas already. Um, the reason why this keeps happening, well, a big part of it is that uh, every new wave of socialists forgets that the rhetoric was already the same last time. They look at previous models of socialism and Venezuela has now become a previous model. And um, they, they look at the outcomes, they look at how those societies are extremely stratified and hierarchical, command and control. And uh, they make the mistake of believing that this was all deliberate. They turn out that way because that was a political choice. They had people in charge who wanted it to be that way. 
when that is not true it uh, it always starts actually with the same idealism and uh, it's just that that then that is the part that gets forgotten you see a society that's extremely hierarchical uh stratified authoritarian it's easy to assume that that society simply turned out that way because the people in charge wanted it to be that way that's that that's the result of political choices but i remember the early stages of this venezuela mania actually quite well uh, because i was an undergraduate student at the time didn't know much about venezuela up until then it was just that um, that was the time when socialists started to use that uh, that as an argument against me, saying, well, Nimitz, you don't get it. Uh, you hear socialism, you think of the old GDR. Um, rubbish. Look at Venezuela. They're doing it completely differently. They're doing it in a, in a non-authoritarian way. They're empowering local people. Uh, they're not just uh, empowering a, a caste uh, of of uh, of elite bureaucrats they're actually decentralizing power dispersing power they're doing it in a completely different way this is a bottom-up socialism this is a, a socialism from the grassroots that was the rhetoric then and that is again the rhetoric now of of the new wave of socialists now they're saying oh no we, we it will be nothing like all those old models this time will be different because we will do uh, a decentralized uh, socialism that it has bottom up and blah blah the same rhetoric again they just forget that that is what this earlier wave also said and uh, of course venezuela wasn't the first time either it's it always starts that way if um and I'm, I'm showing this in, in my own book uh, for examples of which I have no memory. This uh, things that happened before which my time. Which is socialism, the failed idea uh, that never dies, which That's everyone right. should download. Yeah. Abs absolutely. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Where the Maoists in, this, in the 60s and, and early 70s were using the exact same rhetoric where they said, yeah, okay, the Soviet Union and its Eastern European allies, that's obviously dreadful, but that's because they chose the wrong model. They chose a model of bureaucratic socialism. But look at the Maoists, look at what's going on in China now. That's completely different. That's a proper peasants' democracy. They're devolving power. And they, they said the same about Vietnam, about Cuba. And uh, then in the next wave, some people said the same about Albania, saying, yeah, of course, in China, it's gone badly off the rails, but that's because they, they were creating uh, their this bureaucratic elite Albania is doing it differently and then in the 80s Nicaragua is doing it differently there's always some place that supposedly does it differently mm -hmm. and um, it's not so much that the next wave of socialists then forgets about how bad previous examples were that's why it's a waste of time trying to lecture people about how bad the Soviet Union was it's it's more about reminding people that the rhetoric was the same and that the the aims and ambitions were always the same so you think which you do very well and I, I repeat again in socialism the failed idea that never dies which you must 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 download but you talk about the for, for western intellectuals it's always the same three stages which is the honeymoon period during which the socialist experiment is widely held up as a glorious example of real socialism the angry defensiveness which is during which some of the systems failures are acknowledged but blamed on external constraints what would those external constraints be such as uh, well that, that that could be a foreign country interfering with things so US sanctions US sanctions would be yeah Venezuela at the moment is with you get people who are still at stage two they yeah. would say it's because of US sanctions mm -hmm. uh, rubbish of course but those ex excuses are, are, are almost uh, always rubbish uh, and you get the mainstream left that has just moved on and says oh no it never had anything to do with socialism and that is stage three uh, yeah, which is the retroactive disowning. So they disown it altogether. Well, it wasn't real socialism. And this is during which where they say the country in question was never socialist and that it's a cheap straw man to even argue that it was. So basically what you're saying, Christian, is that we need to be a bit more loud and proud about calling them out on this rhetoric because it's the same rhetoric time and time again. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. You have to show that uh, this is what your predecessors, your intellectual predecessors said as well. Uh, what is different this time? In this sense, the Sankara book is a bit frustrating because in one respect, he is more intellectually honest than a lot of socialists. He does not at any point suggest that the Soviet Union wasn't socialist or that Maoist China wasn't socialist. He writes about those examples a lot and acknowledges that they were in a, in a significant sense socialist. 
but still it it you you get the impression that it's always just bad luck it's always adverse circumstances it's all country specific conditions he never seems to stop and ask himself right i've said this now about the soviet union i've said this about maoist china i've briefly said it about uh, tanzania angola mozambique uh, and cuba it's always the same thing uh, he should ask himself am i looking for excuses am mm-hmm. i being entirely honest with myself mm-hmm. and he doesn't do that yeah absolutely well what do you all think at home have you read the books more importantly have you read christian's book will you be rushing out to buy them let us know at iea london and subscribe to this podcast by searching for iea conversations wherever you get your podcasts thanks christian thank you